Welcome back to Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. I'm your host, Emily Johnston, and I'll be taking you along on my journey to learn about all things genetics in extensive livestock. Last season, we explored the foundational aspects of genetics. We discussed everything from basic genetic principles to practical applications on farm. This season, we're kicking it up a notch. Today's guest is Dominic Waters, who is an Associate Lecturer in Quantitative Genetics at the University of New England in Armadale, and has recently finished his PhD. Some of the topics we're going to discuss include Dom's experience during his PhD, including his studies on genotype by environment interactions. This is an episode I can guarantee you'll want to stick around for, and one you'll enjoy. So with that, let's get into it. Welcome back to Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. Today I'm joined by Dominic Waters, who's a special guest on this season. So Dom, I'll, I'll skip the intro and I'll let you do that. It's better off coming from you. So yeah, tell me a bit about yourself and where are you currently working at the moment? Sure. So my name's Dom Waters. Um, I'm an associate lecturer here at the University of New England. Focus on quantitative genetics and genomics is my official role. And I've been in this job for about six months now out of a PhD so at a very early stage of my of my research career I've, I've most of my work's focused on has been applied to in sheep genetics but I've also done a bit of work in in plant genetics as well cool so you did sheep and plant in your PhD yeah correct nice yeah. that sounds interesting so where did this all start for you I guess like take me back to the moment you decided why agriculture? Why genetics? Let's go through the whole lot. Sure. So I grew up in the northern rivers of New South Wales in Ganelaba, which is too far from the beach. And look, growing up, I had a little bit of exposure to agriculture. My dad, before I was around, was a, a shearer. But other than that, other than sort of uncles and, and grandfathers that had property and farms, my exposure to agriculture was quite limited to holidays at the farm and occasional weekends and to be honest like I, I, I didn't really see agriculture as a, a career path for me or as an area that I was interested in at school I definitely had the probably fairly common mindset that agriculture is a boring topic that only students at school who want to bludge take and so it wasn't really until I went to university after I graduated. So I came here to UNE and I did a Bachelor of Science. So I kept it very broad because I didn't really know what I was interested in at the time. And really without me being consciously aware of it, I was sort of drawn in that, drawn into the space through an interest of, I guess, statistics and also genetics. I really enjoyed the genetics and statistics units I, I took. And really, quantitative genetics is a match made in heaven for those two sort of interests. And so, so that yeah, so that, that's basically how I ended up following this path. So into with agriculture. the science degree, it was fairly broad enough where you could like pick subjects that encompassed agriculture or animals. Is that kind of how it worked? Or was the statistics and genetics courses a bit more general and less focused on the agriculture side? So when I originally started, I thought I would like to work in, in a lab and quickly realized I was not cut out for that sort of work. And then both just absolute clumsy cluts. I should not be left near one. And then so the, the units that I took, obviously University of New England has a very strong agricultural background. And so the statistics and the genetics were all highly applied to agricultural systems and I guess also having that background through family I was able to connect things together a little bit and see the value of, of genetics and that it actually is quite a good area to be in and particularly breeding programs and the, and the whole process of a breeding program and fundamentally what it's all about of improving the performance of plants and animals uh, I think it's an awesome, awesome area to be in. So how did you go from undergrad to PhD? Did you end up doing like a honours in genetics and then 
that's what made you pursue your PhD? Like, what made you decide, yep, PhD and it's going to be genetics? Great question. So, really, I just saw that it was an opportunity to do a to do an honours project here. And I did that with um, Julius Vanderwerf and Sam Clark. And I, I found that I enjoyed the topic and then that there was this opportunity to spend a year working on the topic and really immerse yourself in it and acquire the skills that you needed. Starting an honours project, I didn't necessarily know if I would continue to do an honours pro- uh, PhD project, but you, it's, a, it's a great way to f- find out if that's, if that's your thing. And I had a great time. It was so much fun. I learned so much. And it was just sort of a natural progression to continue working in that space through a PhD. And what was your PhD about? Tell me about what you studied. So my research focused on what's called genotype by environment interactions. And so that's when the performance of a, you can think of it in terms of a bull or a ram, whether its progeny perform as consistently as others in, across different environments. So if you, if you give a ram lots of progeny and put it in lots of different environments, whether we can identify particular rams that have progeny that are more robust to, to environmental variation. And so we can look and see how sensitive is their breeding value for important traits to different environments and try and select ones that are potentially more robust to different environments. So that's what I looked at in my, in my thesis, and I found that you can actually identify, in, at least in sheep, when I looked at post-weaning weight, there was significant genetic variation between size in, in how their progeny performed across different environments, and we could potentially utilise that in, in breeding programs. Awesome. So, so why would you say the genotype by environment interactions are significant in livestock breeding programs? So... The significance of genotype by environment interactions is definitely dependent on the trait that you're looking at. So not all traits have the same level of G by E, as it's called, mm-hmm. or genotype by environment interactions. So it's really important to understand that before assigning any importance to it. So the reason it is important when there is there are genotype by environment interactions is that it basically means the best RAM in one environment might not be the best ram or bull in another environment. And so in a breeding program that causes problems because we'd like to select animals that are always the best across all environments. And basically when we have these genotype by environment interactions, it makes it harder to identify what the best animal is and it it can make make it harder to realise genetic gain. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is saying, well, it's another source of genetic variation that we can use as breeders to select animals that are more robust to different environments. And that's sort of the angle that I look at G by E from. Yeah. So I'm guessing that kind of answers the question that I was just about to ask. And that was, so I'm, I'm guessing that's why it's important, was important in your study to have progeny across a wide range of environmental conditions to be able to look at that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but that's even, even without looking at G by E, it's still very important in any breeding program to make sure that you have good linkage across environments. So that means with other other flocks and other across years as well in your data. So the only way to be able to tell if, to tell how sensitive a ram's breeding value is to different environments or a bull's breeding value is, is to give it progeny across different environments and compare it with other genotypes. So, yeah, that's, that's crucial for, for understanding that. Sounds like you did a lot of work on that particular. It sounds, yeah, like you're very well versed in the topic. And you said before that you worked in animals and plants. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I guess that's the PhD, though. It is a bit, you become quite specialised because you spend three years of your life working on a particular area. It's hard not to um, be, be like that, I suppose. <laughs> But it's still, yeah, as I said, it's still a, it's a pretty broad concept. And so, yeah, some of my PhD was in working in a plant breeding data set where it's basically the exact same question. All breeding programs at their fundamental core are quite similar in that we're just simply looking for the best parents to create the next generation. And, and in plants, it's particularly important, these genotype by environment interactions, because 
and, and breeding programs that are entirely designed around capturing genotype by environment interactions. But it's easier said than done when trying to identify plants or animals that are robust across environments. Even though that there is lots of value in potentially doing it, it is a tricky, tricky subject. Yeah, I love that it's all applicable to all sorts of industries. It definitely makes sense when you talk about it, how you know plants and animals have similar concepts and they all should be designed the same. I think that's yeah definitely a great message, especially with people doing a lot of mixed farming these days and producers having a lot of different you know, enterprises. I think that's, yeah, a really strong message that's come across from your work. So talking PhD, I'm curious to hear, do you have any sort of exciting or memorable moments through your research journey? Because it was a couple of years, so I'm sure there was a couple of highlights you can maybe think of. Yeah, so the whole idea of doing a PhD is to extend the frontiers of human knowledge, as, as I'd say. And a lot of the time that's hard to do. And so I was fortunate enough in my PhD to come across a little gold nugget, so to speak, of understanding how we can identify animals that are more robust to environmental variation and basically capturing that in genetic models. And so that was I did that under the context of animal breeding and show that there's this little adjustment that you can make that seems quite interpretable and useful. And and just the other day I saw that it was picked up by someone who works in the plant breeding space and basically has taken that little finding of, of my PhD thesis and then built on it in a much more complex and exciting way. And that and it really is sort of at a level that's at the frontier of analyzing G, G by E in plants. And so seeing that my PhD was able to have some little contribution to that was quite satisfying and that's I think that's also why working in the genetic space is really good because really at the end of the day we're all contributing in in some way to utilizing natural variation that exists in populations and that natural variation is free in the sense that we don't have to give that animal or plant anything to to be more efficient or to grow better or anything that variation exists all we have to do is come up with ways of identifying that and valuing it appropriately and that's basically what a breeding program is we measure animals and plants we evaluate them and select them for for mating and so having just being able to operate in that in that space and knowing that you're working towards creating the perfect animal or the perfect plant if there is such a thing, yeah, is is a satisfying thing. That's awesome. I feel like that's a huge wow moment, especially after spending three years researching this and it obviously taking up a lot of your time and being something you're passionate about, seeing other people use that in real world application. That is awesome, especially, yeah, building on the research that they're doing, just knowing that you've had that contribution into what they're looking at. That's, yeah, that's so good. Congratulations mm. on that. <laughs> so I guess talking PhDs again, what are what were some of the biggest challenges that you felt like you faced during that time? Because I'm sure there might have been one or two, and how did you overcome them? So I guess a tricky part, I started the PhD in June 2020, and so that was right in the depths of uh, COVID lockdowns. So it was quite a bit of an isolating experience because it, it was really quiet on campus and, and in Armadale especially. And so staying motivated when it's, it's, I, it could, was a bit tricky. Other than that, I think that was the main challenge. I think having a good project that you're interested on in is probably the main, the main thing. And also having good supervisors, not naming any names. Uh, but... <laughs> Just a few recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put yep. that in there too. So yeah, having supportive supervisors as well makes it A, quite a great good. journey. Yeah, so now that you've completed it, how has the next phase of your career looked? It sounds like you're doing really well for yourself. So yeah, how is that going? And has it been different, challenging, surprising? Tell me tell me what it's been like. Sure, yeah. So I was fortunate enough after my, I finished my PhD that my supervisors, Julius and, and Sam, were, there, was, there was a job available to work with them as a lecturer, which I've, which I've taken up. And that's definitely been a learning curve because during your PhD, you feel like you're flat out, but you really only have one thing to work on, and that's your thesis. 
now I'm finding that there's all sorts of stuff I'm having to do teaching and, and lecturing, apply for grants, supervise students, and all of these different things, which are basically skills that you don't exercise that much in a PhD, because a lot of the time you just sit at your desk and think about think in your own head about things. And now suddenly you're having to juggle all of this stuff. And I'm sure people are listening, thinking, well, that's, that's life. And I guess that's what I'm learning <laughs> as we go. So for sh- yeah, I, th- I think um, there's, a, there's a few more balls to juggle in this job, which is great. Makes it interesting. Yeah, keeps yeah, it different, fun. gives you something different to have a look at and explore. It sounds like you've got a really great group of people around you as well. And the UNE campus is beautiful. I feel like you're in such a great part of the world to be working. Yeah, for sure. So do you have any sort of advice to anyone who might be considering doing a PhD or someone who's, as you said, in the depths of it and struggling at the moment? Do you have any sort of insight from your own experience that you might be able to to share to someone who needs a little bit of... Sure. Keep grinding away. (laughs) No, I don't know. If you're considering doing a PhD, the best thing you can do is do an honours project or I guess a, a master's project and see if you like it. And before you do anything like that is just to make sure you're working on a topic that you're interested in, the supervisor that you feel understands you and you can work with. For those in the doldrums of a PhD, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but also enjoy it. It's lots of it's a great opportunity and it's lots of fun. Time flies. So and and remember that it's most it tends to work out. It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll great. look most likely look back on it fondly even though you're not feeling that way. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Is there anything that you would have done differently now that you've finished, wrapped up? Mm, good question. Have no regrets. No, that wouldn't change anything. <laughs> Perfect. No, I love that. That's a great way to, to look back on, yeah, all the great work that you've done, Don. Oh, thanks, Emily. Cheers. So I guess that's, yeah, a great way to wrap up today's podcast. So thank you so much for sitting in with me and having a chat it's been great hearing about you know your journey with your PhD and where you're currently at and I'm sure we'll probably do some more work together in the future and I'm sure I'll have you on for another episode and we'll get to chat a bit more about some of the work you're doing looking forward to it awesome thanks Dom cheers and that brings us to the end of this episode of genetics in the paddock with Emily I hope you found our discussion as enlightening as I did This episode was produced by the extensive livestock genetics team within the New South Wales government. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to our podcast on your favourite platform, leaving us a review and sharing it with your friends and colleagues. Your feedback and support help us grow and reach more people who are passionate about livestock genetics. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions for future topics or people you'd like to hear on the show, please feel free to reach out to me on emily.johnston at dpi.newsouthwales.gov.au. Thanks again for listening and until next time. Mm